Indonesia is a university in Indonesia which is located on the island of Java, more precisely in central Java. One of the more than 17,000 islands that belong to Indonesia. One of the faculties that we have is the Faculty of Health Science, in which there is a nursing study program. The routine agenda for this faculty includes bringing in an expert in guest lecture activities. This is intended to provide broader insights to students about the science of nursing. I hope students can take benefits as much as possible from today's event to improve their abilities in the field of nursing, especially critical nursing and nursing research. And I hope that this lecture will help students become a professional nurse in the future. An angel without wings for people who are sick. Well, I don't want to take too much of your time. Once again, welcome and thank you to Professor Xiu Xiao Yan and all participants for attending this event. That is all for me. Now I will leave the rest to the Master of Ceremony to continue this agenda. Regards, President of the University of al Azhar Cilacap, Indonesia. Thus, I have read the welcoming speech from the President of the University of al Azhar Cilacap. For me, I'm very happy today to meet someone from Taiwan. Professor reminds me when I took a short course in Taiwan in 2017. I met a lot of such great people like Dr. Tao Chiha, Dr. Ming Tsai, Dr. Kwan Cheng Chin, and others. I also went to Pingli Traffic Cultural Center or PTCC through the Taiwan National Highway Number no. 5, Chiang Wei Xu Freeway, with the highway tunnel, Sui San Tunnel. It was an extraordinary experience for me. All right, everyone, enjoy on continuing today's program and stay healthy for all. Wabilai Taufik Bahri Daya, Wassalamualaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. Hello, um, can you hear me? Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Agus Pastio, for your speech. It's encouraged us to our main agenda. And uh, for the first is, uh, please allow us to take a photo of for our documentation. Uh, for the participant, please, can you turn on your camera so we can take the picture of you together and give us your best smile, if you could. Okay. Uh, three, two, and one. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. One more time, please. Uh, three, two, one. Okay. Okay. Uh, for the next slide, wait, please. Okay. Uh, three, two, one. Okay, for the next slide. Three, two, one. Next slide, please. Three, two, one. Okay, for the last slide, please. Three, Two, one. Okay, well, thank you for taking a, a photo for our documentation. And then, ladies and gentlemen, now we come into second session is the main agenda of this event that will be delivered by the moderator, Ms. Dewi Prastiani. And Ms. Dewi Prastiani, time is yours.
Okay, well, thank you, Miss Santi, for giving me the opportunity to take off for the event today. Good morning, everyone. I'm Devi Prasatiani, the moderator of today's session. Yeah. I'm very pleased to see you here and welcome all of you to this International Nursing Day Special. With them, nursing care involvement for critical care unit patients and research. Before we start, let me inform you how the session will begin. First is the presentation from our speaker. Will be held in 15 minutes. And then if you or the participants have a question, you can type in the chat box below and I will read them for you. Ladies and gentlemen, as we know that in the era of the Industrial Revolution 4.0, the health sector also experienced disruptions on various fronts. If the nursing profession cannot adapt the, to such rapid changes by conducting research and applying it in practical settings directly to patients, users may leave it. Then the role of nurses can be replaced by other professions that are more adaptive or even replaced by robots. They take advantage of progress. Good and quality advice can be realized if it best done valid research evidence. University of Alisa Cilacap has invited a good speaker who will share her knowledge, her experiences with us on a related them. Our speaker today is Professor Chu Saoyan. She is the deputy director of School of Nursing, Taipei Medical University, Taiwan. Okay, Professor Chu has already with us. Allow me to greet our speaker. Good morning, Professor. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Professor, thank you for accepting our invitation. I'm going to read your profile. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Chu has received her bachelor's degree at the School of Nursing National Yangming University in 2005, took her master's degree at the same university in 2007, and completed her doctorate at the Graduate Institute of Nursing, Taipei Medical University in 2013. And she has a lot of work experiences from 1998 until now. Among others, as an intensive care unit nurse at Linkau Changge Memorial Hospital in 1998, as a clinical instructor in School of Nursing, Changge University of Science and Technology, as a visiting researcher in Human Sleep Research Center, Stanford University, USA in 2012, and as a deputy director at School of Nursing, Taipei Medical University from 2000. 1999, and she already have nine awards from 2015 until 2020. Six awards as a researcher, an award from Ministry of Science and Technology, Taiyohu Memorial Award, two awards from National Yangming University and Changge University of Science and Technology as an outstanding award. Her many research are critical care, neuroscience nursing, safe disturbance risk management, neurofeedback in symptom management, and meta-analysis. And she has 10 research projects. And she has published in 52 journals and 18 conference papers. Well, no doubt, she's an expert. All right, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, please welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation and your wonderful introductions. And um, that's my honor and my pleasure to be today's guest speaker uh, for talking about the uh, critical care issues. 
So um, now, uh, please allow me to share my screen firstly. So can you see my screen now? Um, can you? Okay, yes, not yet. Can see okay. The yes, okay. Professor, okay, we can see it? clearly, Professor. We can see clearly. So you can see it, right? Yes, we can okay, see. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so I know that today I got only got a uh, fifty minutes, but you know I have a lot of things like to share with you. But I will just you know check the points and let you know now what is the current currency of uh, taking care, uh, you know the critical year patients. And I will also put some of my uh, previous research to to support now the current uh, strategy about nursing care. Okay, so uh, you already know what is the today's topic, so I won't uh, repeat it again. So I'm not sure uh, now uh, in front of the screen of you, and do you have uh, any experience in working um, in ICU, but probably you don't know what is the orange of um, uh, critical care. Actually, you know, uh, in the picture, the girl, actually she is our, you know, uh, the great person in nursing air, uh, areas. Her name is Nanding Gale. You probably know who she is. And actually she's the first one to create the concept of critical care in 1850s. You know, because at that time there's a World War I and a lot of soldiers, you know, got hurt. So at that time she trying to create an area and trying to just put all the uh, soldiers uh, with, you know, their, um, a home from the world and just put them together and close uh, watch them. So this is the first thing that we can observe and, and also note that there's uh, some of the intensive care uh, concept. And in 1950s, okay, till now, you know, at that time, uh, there's, uh, you know, ep epidemiology about the polia, polia. And at that time in Copenhagen, in that country, and a lot of you know the childrens they got the uh, polio. So you know if the childrens got the polio, they might impacts their uh, influence their brainstem, and also you know impacts their uh, respiratory functions. So at that time, a lot of like a medical doctor and nurses to think about how they can help those childrens. So they put all these children in a room. At that time, there's a no term called intensive care unit. But, um, but all these uh, you know, medical doctors and nurses just you know, trying to put those um, students together and other technicians trying to build up the uh, you know, artificial uh, ventilator. At that time, they call iron lung. Okay, I wrong wrong. And I wrong wrong at that time, just, you know, uh, trying to help these children to recover their breathing. So this is the picture that took at that time. So you can see that in the middle, there are two medical students manually, you know, ventilated children with polio. Okay, so um, this is the first ICU, uh, you know, built up at that time. So this is now the two that probably you can see in the ICU, you know, uh, now we have a lot, a, a lot of technology assist care here. So as um, ICU nurse, you must know how to uh, use those uh, ventilators or this device. And you also have to closely uh, watch those patients about their, you know, their vital signs and all this, um, you know, data, blood data, and you have to, um, Re reflex what happened to these patients. So I have to say that being a uh, ICU nurse is not as easy as you think. But however, once you overcome all the difficulties, I believe that you will be a good uh, ICU nurse. So now today I would like to bring some of the new idea. I'm not sure have you ever heard, but now the updated one about a uh, clinical practice guideline for ICU patients that published in a, uh, uh, 2018. Okay, and 2018 just uh, published this uh, practice guideline for five uh, very important issues. The first one is about the pain. The second is entertainments or sedation. 
And the third is delirium. The fourth is immobility. And the last one is sleep disruption. So um, these five issues, you know, are highly correlated to each other and also very hard to deal with. And those symptoms also, you know, of, uh, profoundly impacts patient's uh, recovery uh, speed. So that's the reason why, you know, American critical care medicine, they are uh, trying to create these guidelines and uh, would like every, um, you know, ICU doctors and nurses must know that and also know what is the principle and how we can uh, care those patients by using these guidelines. So this is what I want to talk about today. So here I just create a, uh, you know, the, the picture for you and the five issues about the pain, agitation or sedation, delirium, immobility and sleep. But the, today the, we only got uh, 15 minutes, so I will just focus on delirium and sleep issue only. And here, as I mentioned earlier, all the guidelines just, you know, recommended by the Society of Critical Care Medicine from America. So let's quickly just move to the first issue today. So let's look at the issue about sleep in ICU. So, um, you know, uh, mostly around like 66% of the ICU patients they complain they cannot sleep well. And actually this is according to our recent publications in intensive care uh, and the critical care nursing. It, this one just published. Okay, and in this um, meta-analysis, one of my PhD student and I, we trying to investigate the dynamic prevalence of sleep disturbance among those adults are uh, requiring critical care. And um, in our papers, fin finally, we found that, uh, you know, when the patients, they stay during the ICU, uh, around like 66% of them uh, complain, cannot sleep well. And, uh, you know, over time, uh, at the second month after hospitalizations, uh, you know, still around like a four, a 64 patients percent patients they complain cannot sleep well. But you can see that, uh, you know, when they um, discharge from the hospital at the third week, uh, third month, six month, and 12 months, you can see their sleep complaint decrease. So, which means it's a good thing. But however, still around like, uh, you know, 30% of patients, uh, they still complain cannot sleep well, uh, even, uh, you know, discharge from the hospital one year later. So it seems that the sleep issue is a very important thing in ICU. So uh, probably we have to do something for them to relieve their uh, sleep problems. So this is another uh, publication published in 2022. And this study actually collect a lot of, you know, um, uh, study and to look at what, you know, look at detail, what happened to their sleep. And finally, they found that actually patients, they might complain they got decreased total sleep time and sleep fragmentation. What does sleep fragmentation means? Means probably, you know, because in ICU, probably we have to queue two hours to wake patient up and we'll have to change their position or we have to suction, do all the, you know, nursing interventions, even during the night. So you can think about that, how come a patient can sleep very well? So this we call the fragmentation. So because they sleep cannot continuously for whole night. So they will be wake up, you know, frequently. So it's going to fragment their sleep patterns. Okay, here you can see this is the result from this paper. And I know there's a lot of, you know, uh, you know, um, terminology probably you don't understand, but uh, probably I just uh, put some few uh, things that you can understand. The first one is TST. The TST actually is the total sleep time. So here is the ICU patient and this is the healthy adults. So you can see that usually the uh, uh, the ICU patient can uh, sleep around like 6.2 uh, hours versus the uh, health adults. 6.6 .6, and the p-value less than 0 0.01 means yes, ICU patients sleep less than, um, you know, health adult. 
And as you can see, the wassail, wassail is means that during the night after your sleep onset, uh, how many minutes you be wake up. So you can see that usually for adults is around like 48 minutes, but for ICU patient is more than 48. Another uh, indicator probably you might also interesting is about the sleep efficiency. Sleep efficiency means it's uh, more like it's how well you sleep. So usually for uh, normal adults, we suggest that probably you need got the sleep efficiency more than 85%. Okay, as you can see here, but you can see the ICU adults. So they sleep, their sleep efficiency is around like 52%. So you can see the ICU patient cannot sleep very well. I see someone, he rest, uh, rest his hand. So should I, should I just respond now or? Hello, or I can continue. <laughs> Um, hello, hello, permisi, permisi. Okay, hello, can hello. Just continue? Good morning. Yes. Good morning. <laughs> yes. Okay. Professor, yes, please continue. Yes, until okay. nine forty fifty fifty five. Okay. No worry. Okay, so this is another, uh, you know, graph I derived from another paper in 2020. And this one, just let you know, like normal people, you can see the left side. You, you can see that there's a sun, means this is the daytime activity, and this is the nighttime sleep. So the red bar means that you, you got, you know, daily activity, so, so means it's quite well. And uh, during the night, probably you have to get sleep, so you got some patterns, okay? But when you move to here in ICU patients, you know, because you have to wake patient up to do something. So, uh, but however, patient only has few, few time to fall in sleep, okay? So you can see that this, we call the fragmentation. So uh, you, you know how bad of their sleep. So, um, so it, once the patient got disrupted sleep in ICU, what is going to happen? Okay, this uh, consequence include like impact on their immune system, okay? And also like uh, impaired resistance to the infection and altered their uh, nitrogen balance and also impaired their wound healing or their uh, impact their uh, cardiorespiratory uh, functions or their neurological consequence. So it seems that sleep uh, is, is going to impact patients a lot. Okay, so what are those, um, what are the uh, risk factors for the poor sleep in ICU patients? So now according to previous publications, we might know that there are different, uh, you know, uh, resources, okay, about uh, causing uh, the poor sleep in ICU. So the first one include like uh, environmental stimuli. For example, noise or uh, light and the bedside phone, okay? Uh, for non-environmental stimulus, including like a condition and the presentations prior to, um, you know, admissions. And the second is about ICU intervention. The last part is biology. For the conditions, it's more like your comorbidity before you admit it to the ICU. For example, if you've got the COPD, of course you cannot sleep well, or probably you undergo the post-operative situation because you might uh, receive some anesthesia. The drugs is going to impact or destructure your sleep. Or you probably got like a psychiatric problem like depression, anxiety. So if you have this uh, pre comorbidity so when you admit it to ICU, probably will make you more you know, anxious, right? Or like a pain or psychosis or even like a stress. For ICU interventions, uh, the first things probably you have to mention is about the ventilation mode. So we, we all know that when the ICU patient admitted here, if they cannot uh, us, uh, breathe by themselves, so they probably have to put the endotracheal tube with, you know, the ventilations. So you, you all know that it's not really comfortable, right? So we also know that probably quite painful, so patient cannot sleep well. However, actually, uh, according to the updated uh, the study, including ours, we found that actually it's not endotracheal tube 
cause the uncomfortables and the, so the patient cannot sleep well. Actually, the reason is the ventilation mode because uh, you have to adjust the uh, ventilation mode to like a patient ventilation uh, synchronized. Otherwise, patient is going to you know, continue against the, the, the ventilator so the patient cannot sleep. And another one is about uh, if the mode you put like a PSV mode. So during the night, you usually have to use the patient themselves to trigger the ventilator to help them sleep. However, somehow if the patients, they cannot, you know, uh, for example, uh, before they admitted to ICU, you ha they have like a sleep apnea. So this is situation probably is not going to trigger the ventilator. So the ventilation will not provide supply the, the uh, uh, sufficient oxygen to the patients. So my cause, they uh, lack for oxygen. So this situation also might cause the poor sleep because it's going to wake patient up. So here, I just want to let you know, because I'm not sure whether all of you are ICU nurses, but um, just do remember the venti ventilation more are very important. Like in Taiwan, like uh, we, we have, uh, you know, each ICU have the respiratory therapist. So usually the doctor and nurses and a res respiratory therapist is going to work together and discuss about what is the best ventilation mode for the patients. But usually I will uh, suggest them please during the night to do not use the PSDB mode for our patients and that then can have a good sleep at night, okay? And other uh, ICU uh, intervention like uh, dialysis or drugs are the minister, like uh, give them steroid because steroid is going to uh, disturb their sleep pattern as well. And the last part of the biology include like a deep, uh, gender differences because so far the evidence showed that the female probably might uh, sleep uh, worse than male in ICU. So now you can see that um, this is a study in 2012, and they just calculate about the, uh, you know, the resource of uh, noise, uh, the, the, the poor sleep, like, uh, you know, all activity, noise, light, nursing intervention, blah, blah. And you can see that noise occupy the most part. So it means that noise is the, uh, the, 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 uh, biggest okay risk factors for uh, causing poor sleep in ICU, and then their sleep quite interesting. They're trying to look at what is other uh, what are those noise comes from, and you can see that actually the talking from the person now uh, the health uh, professional is the uh, main reason that cause poor sleep. So this also remind us that when you uh, you know work in ICU, please just trying to turn down your <laughs> speak volume, and otherwise it's going to cause the patient cannot sleep well. Okay. So for us, how can we assess the sleep in ICU? So uh, usually there are two ways. One is the objective way. Another one is subjective way. For objective way, of course, we will ask the patient to wear on the etigraph, and the uh, etigraph can help us to, uh, you know, monitor the patient's activity and their sleep patterns for 24 hours, and then for continuous several days. And for polysonography is now, I believe, is the gold standard for assessing their sleep. However, the polysonography, we need the technicians and we also, the, we need to hook up, uh, you know, a lot of sensors on our patients. As you can see the patients on their, you know, head, their nose, their, uh, the muscle near their eyes, and even like uh, their chest, their abdomen, we have to put a lot of sensor because we have to uh, measure their EEG, their EOG, their EMG, and their breathing, a lot of things. So usually pa patient also cannot sleep well if they hook on the uh, polysonography. However, this one is still the uh, gold standard so far. However, uh, for ICU nurses, I think using the etigraph and or the polysonography is not really easy for us. So now uh, in America, there's another 
uh, you know, uh, self-report questionnaires can be used. So now I introduce to you, uh, this one is called the recharge, uh, we call RCSQ, that'll be easier. The RCSQ questionnaires only consists of five items. It's so easy, you just ask them, okay, so what about your last night's sleep? And you can see there's a bar and you just ask the patient to mark their sleep level. For example, this uh, le most left side means a deep sleep and most the right side means the light sleep, just like the uh, bar scale, you measure the pen. Okay, so the patient just, you know, mark their sleep status last night based on their situation. So in total, you can uh, accent around like a five questions. It's very quick, just around like a one minute, you can finish this uh, RCSQ. And now, uh, like in Taiwan, I also got the uh, permission to translate into uh, Taiwanese into Chinese. So uh, in Taiwan now, uh, uh, not most of ICU, but some of ICU, they already use the RCSQ to measure their patient sleep levels. So now you probably know that, okay, the sleep problems uh, is a big issue for those patients. So how we can deal those patients' um, sleep? Uh, usually there are two, uh, you know, major way. The first one is pharmacological therapy. The second one is a non-pharmacological intervention. So uh, as we all know that once you work in, um, you know, the general in the hospital, you know, the sedative hypnotics is the most prescribed therapy for patient to treating their uh, sleep problem, right? So in ICU, the same situations. So usually if the patient cannot sleep well, so the um, ICU doctor probably would give them the like a credit A pens, uh, this kind of like a, a BZD drug to help them to fall in sleep. And another way probably the doctor would think about that we can give them the menatonin. So menatonin, uh, it, you can consider it's a, like a, a supplement. So because melatonin also can be, you know, uh, generated by our body, by our uh, gland in our brain. So the melatonin usually can, you know, uh, secret uh, during the night and help you to fall in sleep. However, because the patient where they stayed at uh, ICU, so their body cannot recognize now is the daytime or nighttime. So the melatonin become, you know, the secretions become a disturbance. So that's why if you give them the melatonin probably can help them to rebuild their sleep pattern. So the two ways, I mean, sedative hypnotics and, and the melatonin uh, has been become the most prescribed uh, pharmacological therapy around the world now. Uh, of course, later probably can share your situation in your IC, whether uh, your IC also use this two uh, therapy to treat the sleep problems. Um, however, as a nurse, I always think about what else we can help our patients. So now I'm trying to develop some of the non-pharmacological intervention to help our patients. For example, like a, a adjustment of the ventilation mode, and this is what I'm doing. And also we think about what are those, uh, you know, a relaxation technician can help our patient. For example, like a, a music therapy. So usually uh, before they sleep, we probably will play um, the MP3 and then, then uh, you know, listen to like ocean sound. Of course, we will base on patient prevalence and make them feel, you know, relaxed and then they can fall in sleep quickly or in a one of our ICU and some of the nurses, they will also use the back massage before they sleep. Of course, uh, another one is uh, the earplugs and eye mask. So these two also have been, you know, largely recommended by previous publications so far. And um, this is another uh, publication from our lab. Uh, of course, the first also is another, uh, is one of my uh, PhD students. And we work uh, uh, because uh, this PhD student also worked in ICU before. So we're trying to find out what is the best non-pharmacological intervention in managing the sleep uh, in ICU patients, okay. 
So in this meta-analysis, in total, we include around like 20 papers. So uh, the 20 papers consist of around, I remember is the sleep uh, 11 intervention, include like eye mask, uh, this is the VR virtual reality, and eye mask plus the uh, ear plug. And this use the music therapy and nursing intervention. And this one is a one foot five plus occupational around uh, about their food. And this is the MEE means the music therapy plus earplug and um, eye mask. And this intervention is earplug and aromatherapy. And this is the, uh, uh, what is, uh, I, let me check because a little bit long time ago. R is a relaxation combined with imagery. And last one is the routine. So uh, this uh, network meta-analysis, we come, uh, come, uh, include around like 20 studies, consist of 11 interventions uh, involve around like 1,207 participants. So we're trying to do like a head-to-head -head indirect comparison to see which uh, intervention is the best one can uh, help our patients sleep better. So um, this is the eight-leg table uh, produced by that study. Probably it's very hard to understand, but just think about that here. There's a, uh, you know, the number, the values is trying to see the two by two tables uh, concept. We call it table. So like here, you can see the uh, value with both sides. You can see that uh, means uh, probably is significant. So you can see the MEE with the most significant values when compared to the music alone, eye mask uh, plus uh, earplug, and also compared to the nursing intervention and routine care. So we can see the music plus EE had the largest, uh, you know, treatment effect in improving their sleep. So uh, in this study, our conclusion is that we uh, recommend actually the nurses in ICU, you can use the eye mask alone and music combined with the ear products and eye mask to, uh, you know, uh, treat their sleep problem in ICU. However, According to our uh, publications, you can see that this is the ear plug. Usually, the uh, we hope that the uh, you know uh, ear plug can help the patient because it's going to isolate the patient from those noise, right? But however, you can see that when compared to other treatment, actually the ear plug be ranking as the worst one. So uh, when we you know, visit our patients, we ask them why you don't want to use the ear plug. Uh, the patients say that because when they put on the ear plug, it makes them more you know, fear about the situation because they cannot hear everything. So uh, even though they cannot hear the noise, but they don't want to be you know, isolated from the uh, environment. So ear plug actually based on our study and previous, you know, recommendations. We also see, make the same conclusion is that, oh, wait a minute. Okay. Uh, we think that ear plug, we do not recommend the, uh, the ICU nurse to use uh, this to improve your patient's sleep. However, the eye mask alone or music combined with ear plug or eye mask or you just use the uh, music combined with eye mask can help our patients sleep good. Okay, and then uh, let's move to the uh, second part about the delirium in ICU. And so far, I'm not sure whether you have ever heard the term about the delirium. So I would like to briefly talk about the uh, definition of delirium. Delirium actually is an acute, uri, uh, acute uh, status and usually is uh, reversible. And we also can consider this one uh, is a cerebral dysfunctions. So probably uh, when you see the patient, patient might, you know, present some of neuropsychiatric symptoms. So later we'll introduce more. So according to previous publication, we found that in ICU patient around like 30 or more than 30 percent, they uh, they might um, got the uh, uh, medical ventilation 
patients. And in those 30% uh, patients with ventilation use, they got around like more than 87% have, have been delirium, ICU delirium. So now, as we know that the causes of uh, ICU delirium include like a duration of uh, mechanical uh, ventilation use, hospitalization or a self um, exploitation or long-term cognitive impairments and mortality. Okay. As you can see, um, this is the uh, classification classifications of ICU delirium. And uh, actually, basically, the uh, ICU delirium can be divided into three different levels. The first one is hyperactive. And the second one is hyperactive. The last one is mixed type. So uh, as you can see that actually in ICU, the most uh, uh, delirium we might observe is a hyperactive one. But this one actually only occupy around like 12 to 13% of our patients. So although it's the most observed types, but it's the real one. Okay, so usually the patients uh, might exhibit their behavior like uh, agitations or restlessness and emotional liabilities. And uh, once we identify those patients uh, with delirium, usually their RAS score will uh, present around like positive one to positive four. And later we will introduce RAS score later. And uh, hypoactive actually is the most common thing. And however, this one is also often ignored mostly and uh, by ICU nurses. So this one occupy around more than half of our patients. So usually patients might exhibit like a decreased responsiveness, withdrawal, and apathy. So uh, if we identify patients with delirium, usually their rest score were uh, located around like negative one to negative three. And around like 30% patients, they might present as like a mixed type of delirium. So uh, this type of patients, they might have like a fracture eight uh, between the two types, the hyper or hypo. Um, I'm not sure have you ever noticed that part, but uh, usually you might see the hyperactive uh, delirium in ICU, but hypo usually will ignore that part. And somehow probably if you're not really familiar with the delirium, the term, so probably you will use other terms to call the delirium in ICU. We probably like ICU psychosis, ICU syndrome. This is probably a, a would be another term so you might call the delirium. I'm sorry, but it's a lot, a little bit a lake. So okay, Professor. Yeah, so okay. So um as you can see, this um this is just the uh pre uh disposing factor and precipitating factor. What does a uh, predisposing factor means? This is uh, what you are originally. And probably it's very hard to change. For example, like your old age or your uh, probably before you come here, you already got like a dementia or stroke and like a functional status, like a, uh, you got a stroke or you are the de uh, dependency status kind of, okay? And that precipitating uh, factors is more like a, like a, uh, when you admit it in ICU, uh, what else uh, probably will add on to the basic situation? Like uh, you might face acute stress, like sepsis, surgery, anesthesia, major trauma or higher fever, or like uh, probably you may be admitted, administer like a basal um, you know, the drugs or like a, a, a PA, this like a, a pain uh, relief, those drugs. So those more all is going to cause the happen, the occurrence of ICU delirium. So uh, once you want to, once the patients, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, got the ICU delivery is very, very, very hard to deal with because I believe that in ICU, if you have the ICU, experience, you are going to give them sedation. But actually, the sedation is also one of the benzodiazepine pens. So those drugs is going to make the ICU delivery worse. Okay, and you probably will give the physical uh, restraint, and you are going to tie the patient on the bed, and all the situation will make the ICU delivery worse and worse. So now uh, for the uh, guideline, we hope that we can, you know, identify the um, or screen the ICU delivery uh, at the very early beginning, and then we can do some preventions uh, things to those patients and to delay the, or also, you know, decline the uh, incidence of um, ICU delivery. So now according to the uh, guideline, the PADIS guideline, so they suggest that uh, every the nurses must assess or screen the deliverance every shift per day at the list once. Uh, probably later you can also share your uh, routine care with us uh, because I also want to know in uh, in your country whether you also assess the delivery quite often. And so now there, are, as you can see, there are five um, uh, questionnaires tools probably can be used in assessing uh, ICU delivery. But as you can see, the first three actually is the uh, the recommended ones by the 2018 PEDIS guideline. The first one is the can I see you the full name I put in here, the confusion assessment methods for use in intensive care unit patient. And the second we call the ICDSC. Um, the full name is the intensive care delivery screening checklist. These two actually are very popular. And in Taiwan, uh, uh, different uh, hospital, they choose different uh, tools. But no matter what, the two tools has their merit, uh, merits and also disadvantage. Later, I will show you more. So um, as you can see that this one is the uh, CHEM ICU. So CHEM ICU is the oldest uh, tools has been developed in long time ago. And this one has been used um, in in non-verbal ventilated ICU patients at the beginning. So actually, if you want to use the CAM ICU, there are two steps. The first one, you have to check the level of consciousness by using the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale, we call RAS. And this one is going to, uh, usually, you know, the patients that use the sedation, you will use the RAS score to check the sedation level, whether it's in the good level, is too deep, or too light. So RAS score is also the uh, routines used, you know, the, the, the tool in ICU. And the second step, you, once you got the RAS score and then you can uh, use the CAM ICU to assess the patients. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the figure I show you, actually only four items you are going to ask the patients. And the feature one is going to assess patients' acute change or fluctuating courses of their mental status and the feature two is going to look at their attention. And then you can see there's a feature three is going to look at the a third a level of consciousness and the feature four is this organized thinking. If we want to identify a patients with stedarians, the patients must fit the two criteria, uh, either one. The feature one plus two plus three or the feature one plus two plus four. So if the patients meet the, either one of the situation, we will identify patient with the different positive. And uh, um, this is the RAS score. The RAS score, actually they are different levels from the negative five to positive four. And actually in the middle zero means alert and calm. And this is the situation usually we got, right? But if you on, uh, you put down the sedation on the patients, and usually the patient might have like a drowsy, light sedation, moderate sedation, uh, deep sedation, or arousable. And usually the from the negative one to negative three is more like a verbal stimulation. When you use the verbal uh, stimulation, patient can be wake up. 
However, if the patient moves into the uh, negative four to five, means you must use the physical stimuli. But usually move to the uh, negative four or five, it's very, very hard to wake your patient up. And this is also the reason if the patient a rough score between a negative four to five, usually you have to stop the, uh, you have to adjust the sedation. That's the first step. And also you have to stop the assessment of uh, the delirium. The, the That's because you cannot wake them up. Of course, you cannot ask them questions. So you have to adjust your sedation level, discuss with your physician. So it's too deep for your patient. So once you adjust the uh, medication, levels and the patient go back to the negative one to two or even three you can uh, assess the delirium uh, later by using a chem icu and um, this is the whole picture about the chem icu because i, I but i have to say that today we only have got 15 minutes usually i, I will spend like three hours to teach you how to do the um, chem icu because there are some of the strategy you must ask the patients for example, that you might ask a patient, okay, if I, I'm going to read a series of uh, the letters, if I, I read around like A, you have to hold my finger kind of, so you are going to give them some of the test. So this is how we do in our ICU, or you can give them some of the picture and ask them to point out uh, what is the picture I just show you, for example. And uh, however, um, today we have limited time, but I hope that in the future we have time to uh, show you this. And uh, of course, if you are interested in about the CAMIC, you can also go online to uh, check that because a lot of information you can find. And the second one is about the ICDSC. So ICDSC is uh, quite different uh, from the uh, Chem ICU. That's because I think ICU and uh, ICDSC is more for me. I think it's more friendly because you don't need to ask the patient's questions specifically. You can just you know finish, finish your uh, routine care. For example, like at nine a.m. Uh, you give the drug administer or you do the physical assessment or examination kind of. So once you complete the, uh, you know, one a shift, to, uh, you know, your routine care, actually you can come back to fill in the ICDSC. So that's mean the ICDSC is basically rely on your observations during your shift. So um, there, uh, there are uh, eight items you might, uh, you know, assess. For example, like a third level of consciousness, inattention, disorientation, hallucination, or psychosis, or psychomotor agitations or retardations, appropriate speech, mood. And the last one is the, a third sleep and wake cycle. And probably you will find that, okay, Professor, uh, you lack one item. Yes, because the last item is not ask the patient or opposite patient any, uh, uh, you know, behaviors. Uh, the last item is going to see that is there any change uh, between your shift and uh, the, uh, the last shift. If the last shift, for example, like a alternate level of conscious is zero and uh, in your shift become one. Okay, so you can see the change. The last shift is zero and your shift is one. So once zero become one, so the item eight, you are going to give one point. So this is how we work. So uh, the total score, uh, basically you can get zero from uh, eight and usually the cutoff point is the four. So if you use the ICDSC and patients with the score greater than or equal to four, you can define the patient is delirium. And uh, uh, basically, uh, one of my PhD students and I also do a meta-analysis to investigate the which one, ICDSC and uh, the um, can I see which one is the best one for us to, to use in ICU? And here we just uh, show you the description about the two tools. And you can see that the origin population, the can I see was published, uh, was done in uh, the medical ICU patients. And for ICDS, uh, can be used in two uh, population, I mean, medical and I, uh, surgical ICU patients. And about the features or items, chem ICU consists of four and ICDSC consists of eight. 
Okay, and you can see previously the reliability uh, uh, from previous publication is around like 89 to 97. And for ICDSC is also good. And uh, the time span is around like a two to three uh, minutes. And ICDSC uh, is around like two minutes. And the language are variable, as you can see that a lot of uh, language you can see, but now I, I didn't see any uh, Indonesian version. So probably you can try to translate it one. And uh, the, the score system I already introduced to you. So uh, once you're familiar with the tool, it's quite easy to use it. And um, actually the old content is from the, uh, one of my publications. And we're trying to compare the two tools, the CAMICU and ICDSC. And uh, uh, this is the uh, sensitive, uh, sensitivity and specificity to the two, two, for the two tools. And basically you can see that actually the uh, sensitivity for CAM, ICU and ICDSC are quite you know, compatible. One is a point for uh, A4 and another one is point A3. However, you can see that the specificity, what the specificity means, specificity indicate that the tool has the ability to exclude the patients who uh, do not diagnose with a DDRM. Okay, so uh, you can see that the ICU has better ability in uh, screening out the patients without DDRM uh, with a sensitivity of uh, 0.95 when compared to ICDSC. So um, this is what our uh, recommendation. So actually, if you want to assess a patient with DDRM, you can use CAM or ICDSC, either one in your ICU, okay? Okay, so once you assess uh, ICU by using the two tools, so, so, so once the patient, yes, they got the DDRM, what else we can do? So as we mentioned earlier, so from the pharmacological uh, perspective, usually the doctor that will use like a, uh, you know, benzodiazepine strongest like this. But however, uh, now uh, the only one a drug be recommend to uh, to treat the uh, delirium is this one. Uh, I have to pronounce it, bit, but it's very hard. But for us, we have another uh, production name is called Prosidex. I'm not sure you use the same one, Prosidex. Uh, but their uh, chemical name is the uh, Demedetomidin. Okay, this drug. And now in Taiwan's ICU uh, has been popularly used to uh, uh, to prevent and also treat the um, delirium, ICU delirium. But now, according to the PEDIC's uh, guideline, we still recommend a non-pharmacological intervention to help our patient uh, to uh, manage their ICU delirium. Um, now, according to their guideline, they hope that we can build up a multi-component non-pharmacological intervention to focus on this. So probably you have ever heard, probably you have heard that uh, ABCDE bundle. What is the ABCDE bundle you can see here? And you can easily find the ABCDE bundle that published in 2018. And uh, A means assess and prevent, manage their pain. And also you have to look at the bo both SAT and SBT. The SBT and SAT means that uh, you have to, uh, for example, like a spontaneous um, uh, stop their sedation during daytime. So you can uh, assess patients, you know, their consciousness, and also you can check their delivery uh, status. And for SBT means it's like, we hope that the patient can win in their ventilation as early as possible. So we hope that during the daytime, we were training, they can like a self breathing during the daytime is the SBT spontaneous breathing test. So this is the B. The C is the chosen of the uh, sedation. So as I mentioned earlier, the sedation drug is very important. Like uh, please do not use the uh, benzodiazepine drugs. So usually we recommend to use the Presidex and also please winning the, uh, the, the, the ventilation as early as possible. So, and also we hope we can uh, target the light uh, sedation. So do you re uh, remember the light sedation by using the raw score is around like negative three to negative uh, one. Okay, and D is the daily monitoring and management. So you can routinely use uh, ICDSC or uh, CAM ICU kind of, and you have to uh, trying to manage their daily like use the um, the procedures. And the E means uh, early mobilization. So usually we will require our patient to 
uh, you know, uh, get out of the bed as early as possible. So for example, like uh, now we will have like a, a physical therapist or, or occupational therapist will uh, get into ICU and help our patient to do some, you know, uh, activity or exercise on the bed. Once we found that their muscle power is okay, we will move our bed, uh, our patients uh, into another chair that just need the uh, bed. And so this is the concept of early mobilization because we believe that if the patient they can get out of the bed, probably can help them to spend their you know, breathing capacity so they can uh, win in their ventilation uh, as early as possible. And the last part is AFE means family engagement and empowerment. So, you know, uh, during the COVID-19 uh, periods, uh, this part is very hard because we cannot let our family to come in and engage all our management. But at that time, we do some changes, like we use the like a video or kind of the social media. So we, we still will let our patient to meet their families through those social media, trying to keep the ABCDF um, still can work during the COVID-19 period. Excuse me, Professor. Yes, we have three. We have three minutes left. Okay, no, no worry. I'm going to uh, be finished. Okay, thank you. And um, this is the uh, previous publication. The same. Uh, we look at the non-pharmacological interventions for preventing delivery in ICU patients. And in total, we got 29 study involved. And this is the same I told you, we use the network meta-analysis, the way to look at what is the best treatments for our patients. Um, as you can see that uh, because of time limitations, so we can just look at the conclusion here. And actually the multi-component strategy, just like the ABCDEF was the most effective non-pharmacological in reducing the incidence of ICU delivery. And mostly part we want to mention, the early mobilization and family participation involvement actually is a very uh, important two components that you must involve into the um, uh, multi-component strategy uh, in improving the, in, uh, to reducing the incidence of ICU delirium. So this is also what I'm doing because uh, in addition to this, now I trying to develop different VR program, the virtual reality and help our patients to have their early mobilization on their bed or also can help them to sleep well. And even we can uh, use the VR to let them can see their family participations. Okay, so I think this is all my today's presentation. I hope that you uh, learn some new uh, things uh, or perspective or new strategy in treating the sleep issue and uh, deliverance in ICU patients. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor, for giving us such informative and interesting presentation. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now come to the Q&A session. Let's see, just give me a second. Um, would you pull up the question? I can see, I can see clearly, okay. Okay, um, I already have three questions here in the chat box, Professor. Um, would you answer each question or all together? Uh, I, can, I can do it one by one. Okay, okay, yes. Okay, I did it uh, for you. Um, the first one is coming from Mr. Suko Ranovo. Asks about how about research on the use of prayer in uh, unconscious patients in the in the ICU. What can be observed in this patient? Okay, Professor. So please. Okay, thank you so much. But so far, I haven't done any uh, literature review about the prayer in unconscious uh, patients in ICU. But of course, we, you, we have to, if you want to do this kind of study, you also have to check if there's any uh, underlying mechanism that you might think is effective for the ICU patient. But I think um, uh, probably we can do something more. But this one, I really never uh, searched about that part yet. Okay. okay. Okay, thank you. And the second one, the second question is from um, Husna. Asks about 
how does an ethical review conduct research on unconscious patients? Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's a good question because I think ethical review is a very important thing before you conduct a study. And uh, usually in my previous uh, experience, because what we want to do some interventions, so usually we need the patient to interact with our intervention content. So in my, uh, you know, the IRB the applications, usually I include the conscious patients. But for unconscious patients, I think it should be okay as well. You just need to detail to write down what you are going to do to those patients and how are you going to protect those patients from the harms. So you the ethical review will pass you approve so don't worry we'll approve your uh, applications so just uh, just write down clearly yeah okay okay thank you again uh, professor thank you and the last question is from masofa would you please pull up the question i can please see, i can see clearly okay uh oh, oh, yes Okay, so about the third question is the possible risk factor based on biology due to the gender difference. Are there differences in sleep pattern and sleep quality in women and men? Are there differences in treatment based on gender so that we can get good sleep? Um, yes, actually the gender issue is always interesting in sleep field uh, because usually, uh, you know, like uh, some of uh, like, you know, like insomnia actually usually uh, commonly happen in uh, female than male. But if you, if you look at another kind of sleep uh, problem, we call like objective, uh, oh, obstructive sleep apnea, usually occurred in male more than female. And so I think this is uh, from our biological structure before, but, but I think for the poor sleep for uh, female commonly see the male in ICU, that's because I think female, they, uh, we are more anxious than male. So when we admit it to ICU, so we probably will feel more anxious and you know um, fear about the environment. So that's the reason why it's going to cause the, uh, and also I think female is more sensitive more sensitive. So this all cause that female might, you know, um, you know, uh, easy to get the poor sleep you uh, during the ICU stay. Yeah, but for treatment, I think it will be the same. But this is it means that female is mine easier uh, to get the ICU sleep, poor sleep. Okay, not it doesn't mean that the treatment will be different. I think that's clear answer from Professor. Okay, actually we have two questions more, Professor, to Mike. Yes, the question sent directly to me. Would you mind, Professor, okay. to answer two questions more? Hello? Yes, yes. Okay, the question comes from Mr. Kasron, one of our lecturers here. The question is why WASO has a negative effect on sleep quality? What we do as nursing in Indonesia to increase it? Because at regularly, Indonesian people at four or five, we are wake up. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good question. So this is not for ICU patient or for ICU patient. <laughs> because um, um, I just want to clarify because in ICU patient, I believe that you won't wake the ICU patient up during the four to five for praying, right? You won't, right? <laughs> Were you? Okay. Were you? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So for... um. I'm sorry, I just want to clarify. So the question is for ICU patient or for the normal people in Indonesia? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, for the normal people, Professor. Oh, for normal people? Okay, okay, not for ICU patient. Okay. I think also, um, um, it's a very difficult thing to do with. Uh, I also know that we have a lot of Indonesian students. We know 
your condition and I okay. And so usually uh, if you want to wake up early, that's okay. Actually, you can sleep as well. Wasso means a wake up after your sleep onset. So the wasso, it doesn't equal to you wake up so early. Okay, so I think wasso, if you frequently happen, not because of you wake up early, okay, by you have to do the praying, probably something happened. For example, like uh, you drink too much water and you have to go to the toilet or you, you, you got the light sleep. Got sorry, different stage, stages. You so probably you are in. Oh, I'm so sorry. So, uh, uh, should I? Hello. Again, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Hello, yes. I can, I can hear you. Please. Can you hear me? Because it seems like your internet is a bit weak. So, 好，没问题。哎，我前面会不会很不稳啊？这一题您方便帮我们再说一次吗？刚刚前面都蛮清楚的，那只有这个题目的时候，您回复的时候好像频宽比较低一点点。好，那现在可以吗？听得到吗？现在可以。听得到吗？可以，是清楚的。谢谢老师。OK， thank you. Sorry. So let me repeat it again. So uh, usually the wasso is associated with some of the uh, activity or you got the light uh, sleep during the night. So not, uh, not correlated to you wake up so early for your playing. So um, I think uh, if, you, if you think that uh, the uh, wake up early for your playing, probably I would suggest you to sleep early. Okay, so you still can get enough your total sleep time. So it would be okay. But for reducing the wasso, usually the wasso is associated with like you got light sleep during the night. So you can, you might be easy to be wake up by like a, a cold air or like a, by your bed pattern if they just, their uh, position wake up by or um, probably you drink too much water, like this is a real uh, increased, but it's not really, really uh, correlated to the wake up so early for your playing. Okay, so I hope that I respond to your questions. Is it okay? Oh. Okay, thank you, Professor. Okay, um, ladies you. and gentlemen, we finally come to the end of this session. Before I close this session, I'd like to thank to our speaker, Professor Xu, for the informative and interesting information. And of course, all to the participants for your very active participation. Finally, give the big, the big applause for the speaker and for you, all participants. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And we back to the master of ceremony, Ms. Santri. Hmm? Oh, hello, hello everyone. Hello. I'm Sean, the coordinator of Taiwan International Healthcare Training Center. And this year is our 20th anniversary. And in the past 20 years, we have received over 2,000, 2,000 healthcare professionals, including doctors and nurses from 74 countries all over the world. And next, we'll have a, a video about daily life of THTC. 
and hope you guys enjoy. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Harsh Jakhedia from India. Last year I joined Taiwan International Healthcare Training Center's Dermatopathology Training Program. Wanna see how my life is like in Taiwan? Let's get going. This is our training lab. Let's go. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My clinical training consists of routine sign outs, weekly review of typical and atypical cases on Wednesdays, clinical pathological conferences on every Thursday, immunofluorescence and electron microscopy reporting, learning from archived slides and cases and monthly self-assessment and topic tests. Dr. Wu is a great mentor and great teacher. If you have interest in dermatopathology, I would definitely recommend this program. The level of uh, medical service in Taiwan is, I think it's outstanding, it's uh, very amazing. We also have many medical centers and provide uh, advanced medical care for the students or the uh, scholars. We have a very good uh, subspecialty training or specialty trainings. For the training of dermatopathology, this is a very subspecialty. Not many training centers can do this job. There is an international committee for dermatopathology. They will accredit the uh, training center in the world. There's only two sites in Asia. The site in Taipei, our program, is the first accredited program for this ICDP. This is also a, a major site of Asian Society of Dermatopathology. And I'm the current president of uh, ASD. And we will provide many, many teaching resources. So if you come to our programs, hope that can help in your future career. Those are from the same sales. It's lunchtime. Lunchtime. Lunch time. Lunch time. Good break. I love Taiwanese food so much. Taiwan breakfast restaurants are pretty common and they would be open from early morning till afternoon. I got my joy open. Yay! TSTC is just like my family in Taiwan. We always have fun and celebrate all the special days together. We make rice dumplings during the Dragon Boat Festival. We twerk and dance at the year-end party. We celebrate the Christmas and open the gifts together. We have birthday parties every now and then. Everyone stay safe, stay happy and stay healthy. Thanks to THTC, I have experienced almost every aspect of the Taiwanese culture. I would really like to thank THTC for giving me such an indelible training experience. Not only do they have a wonderful dorm room, which makes me feel at home, but they also help me find the best hospital for my clinical training. Everything I've learned during my training would be conducive to the reinforcement of my profession. Congratulations. Thank you. For your learning in Taiwan. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I love Taiwan. I love THTC. Your first choice of clinical training platform. Thank you. So I will put the, the link of our Facebook group, the Facebook fan page in the chat box. And if everyone is interested in about, like, want to know more information, you can check uh, on our Facebook fan page. Thank you.
Before we get to the last session of this event that is closing, I'm hoping that what we have conducted today will be useful for us. As the Master of Ceremony, thank you for you all participants that making time to join us. Oh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good luck and see you. Hari ini adalah semangatku untuk menebar inspirasi. Sahabatku, kita akan bertemu dalam tangga kesuksesan. Seiring dengan perjalanan hidupku, aku terhanyut dalam menggapai mimpiku. Atkala makna dan jati diri dalam menggapai mimpi. Yang terus didengungkan agar selalu terikat di dalam sanubari. Sahabat, keberhasilan terjadi jika ada niat, usaha, dan doa. Hadapkan wajahmu selalu ke arah matahari sehingga bayangan akan jatuh di belakangmu. Bukan sukses namanya jika tak butuh perjuangan. Dan di setiap perjuangannya akan mengenalkan kita banyak hal tentang kehidupan ini. Sahabat, kita tak pernah tahu seberapa baik sebuah pilihan yang kita tentukan. Namun, kita tahu Tuhan lebih tahu yang terbaik untuk kita. The key to success in life is to pursue what you do. Masih banyak cerita dan tawa yang akan kita rangkai di sini. Universitas Al Irsyad Cilacap menebar inspirasi ke seluruh penjuru negeri. Semangatku untuk menebar inspirasi. Sahabatku, kita akan bertemu dalam tangga kesuksesan. Seiring dengan perjalanan hidupku, aku terhanyut dalam menggapai mimpiku. Atkala makna dan jati diri dalam menggapai mimpi. Yang terus didengungkan agar selalu terikat di dalam sanubari. Sahabat, keberhasilan terjadi jika ada niat, usaha, dan doa. Hadapkan wajahmu selalu ke arah matahari sehingga bayangan akan jatuh di belakangmu. Bukan sukses namanya jika tak butuh perjuangan. Dan di setiap perjuangannya akan mengenalkan kita banyak hal tentang kehidupan ini. Sahabat, kita tak pernah tahu seberapa baik sebuah pilihan yang kita tentukan. Namun, kita tahu Tuhan lebih tahu yang terbaik untuk kita. The key to success in life is to pursue what you do. Sahabat, masih banyak cerita dan tawa yang akan kita rangkai di sini. Universitas Al Irsyad Cilacap menebar inspirasi ke seluruh penjuru negeri. Semangatku untuk menebar inspirasi. Sahabat.
kesuksesan. Seiring menggapai mimpi dan jati diri dalam menggapai mimpi yang terus didengungkan agar selalu terikat di dalam sanubari. Ada niat, usaha, hadapkan wajahmu selalu ke arah matahari sehingga bayangan akan jatuh di belakangmu. Bukan sukses namanya jika tak butuh perjuangan. Dan di setiap perjuangannya akan mengenalkan kita banyak hal tentang kehidupan ini. Sahabat, kita tak pernah tahu seberapa baik sebuah pilihan yang kita tentukan. Namun, kita tahu Tuhan lebih tahu yang terbaik untuk kita. The key to success in life is to pursue what you do. Sahabat, masih banyak cerita dan tawa yang akan kita rangkai di sini. Universitas Al Isad Cilaca menebar inspirasi ke seluruh penjuru negeri.